Number four. The moral character described in Scripture is of vital importance to the preservation of government and the happiness of a people. The Scriptures do not decide the particular form which a civil government ought to take. This is left to be determined by those who constitute themselves into a national condition. But the Scriptures determine the principles upon which a government should be constituted, and these are the great principles of equity contained in the Decalogue and in the moral preceptive parts of the Bible. Regulated by these, civil government will be equally removed on the one hand from tyranny and oppression, and on the other from popular licentiousness and disregard of lawful authority. During the course of 4,000 years, the greater part of the nations of the world have been oppressed by wicked rulers. But oppression has produced resistance, and the current of opinion throughout the world is rapidly flowing into an opposite extreme. An extreme equally at variance in principle with the law of God and the good of society as the former. And unless the aspect of the times in this respect undergoes a remarkable change, the world may yet experience from popular violence evils as great, if not in dur duration, at least in intensity, as those that have hitherto been felt under tyrannical misrule. It is natural to man to err, and error delights in extremes. It is the more necessary, therefore, to guard against such evils. For a government that admits one or other of these extremes is not the ordinance of God. Although Scripture does not define the form, it furnishes principles that ought to direct a people in constituting and administering national government. The good of society is the immediate, and the glory of God is the ultimate end of civil government. No form, therefore, can be agreeable to the institution of God that does not accomplish both of these ends. To pretend to seek the one of these at the expense of the other is to oppose the design proposed by God in the institution. Indeed, they cannot be successfully sundered. They have been linked together in heaven's purpose, so that the neglect of one will ultimately prove the destruction of the other. No form, however popular, can ultimately secure the good of society, which sets aside the claims of the governor of the nations. Disregard to these will open a floodgate through which popular right will finally be swept away. The idol, excuse me, and the idol, for whose sake God has been dishonored and Messiah robbed of his prerogatives, will devour its thoughtless devotees. On the other hand, no argument is necessary to show that a government which tramples on popular rights and thwarts the good of society is not the ordinance of God. The claim of divine right put forth on behalf of such a government is fraught with impiety and an outrage on common sense. Human wisdom cannot contrive a system of government that shall possess permanency of duration in the formation of which the written word of God has not been consulted and respected. It is necessarily imperfect, and its imperfect construction leads to dissolution because it lacks that element which alone can give cohesion to the parts and bind them together till time grows old. I want that conservative it, excuse me, it wants that conservative principle which alone can preserve a government from falling into decay. The want is an essential weakness that must soon betray itself by the most unequivocal symptoms of dissolution. The more popular, too, the form of government may be, in which the conservative principle of biblical morality does not find a place, so much greater is the danger. In less popular forms, individual virtue has a larger and more influential operation, which may regard, excuse me, which may retard for a time the process of decay. In the former, the influence which the mass of the people possess, though rightful in itself, is more likely to be abused than in the latter, if the revealed will of God is overlooked. The more widely power is diffused among a people, the greater will be the descending velocity whenever the regulating principle is removed. A civil ruler, Lord Bacon says, quote, must make religion the rule of government and not to balance the scales. For he that casteth in religion only to make the scales even, his own weight is contained in those characters, mene, mene, tekel, eupharsin. He is found too light, his kingdom shall be taken from him. And that king that holds not religion, the best reason of state, is void of all piety and justice, the supporters of a king." Unquote. Bacon's Works, Volume 2, pages 393 and 394. Section 5. The Duties Required of a Government Next to the glory of God, the happiness of a people is the great end of civil government among men. The more perfectly that it secures these ends, the greater perfection it will have obtained. The civil ruler, quote, is the minister of God for good, unquote, to man. 
He is called to the administration of government, not that he may seek his own aggrandizement or pursue his own selfish and ambitious purposes, but that he may serve God by promoting the happiness of the people over whom he is called to bear rule. Number one, it is the duty of a civil government to, pr to protect the people from external violence and aggression. This duty includes in it the power of employing correct, uh, excuse me, the power of employing coercive means and of making war. To refuse a government this power is to take away from it the means of securing the happiness of the people. As long as, they are, as long as there are wicked men and immoral governments which disregard the claims of equity and encroach upon the rights of other nations, compelling obedience to their unjust demands by brute force, so long must a righteous government have the power of defending its citizens from such aggressions. And, in doing this, they must repel force by force. For remonstrance and other moral means cannot repel overt acts of violence. For a government to decline or neglect this means of defending a nation would be to encourage unprincipled nations with whom they have intercourse to the commission of every kind of outrage upon them. It would be a surrender of all that is dear to man on earth to the unrestrained violence of such a professed power without principle. War, I admit, in itself is tremendous evil and is always connected with and followed by the most distressing circumstances, and no prudent government will rashly employ it, even in cases of the greatest magnitude as a means of defense, nor will they at all, for slight reasons, enforce their rights by an appeal to the sword. The good to be secured must be sufficiently great to counterbalance the certain evils which war must necessarily inflict. In cases of the greatest magnitude, in cases of the greatest magnitude, war cannot be waged without a violation of Christian principle till all other means have been tried and have proven unsuccessful. But when moral means fail, self-preservation, common sense, and the unalterable dictates of justice say that war is necessary and just. To decline it in such instances is to decline the only means of a nation's security and therefore fail to obtain a leading object of government, the happiness of a people. That the greater number of wars that have been waged in the world have been unjust and unchristian, I most readily concede. These, however, are only an abuse of national power and form no objection against waging war on just grounds. Number two, it is the duty of a government to protect its citizens in the enjoyment of their rights. Citizens may be restrained in the enjoyment of their desires without any encroachment upon their rights. Right is defined by law. And when the desires of men grasp at objects irrespective of law, they are not deprived of any right when they are restrained from possessing them. Liberty or human right, in its most exalted sense, consists in being maintained in the possession of whatever is secured to man by the divine law. I do not say whatever may be secured by the constitution and laws of a country, because these may be most unrighteous. The law of God is the standard by which all right must be tried and in accordance with which constitutions of civil government and laws ought to be made. No man can have a right to do what he pleases. This would not be liberty, but licentiousness, and instead of promoting the happiness of a people, would most certainly destroy it. The pleasure and the will of the powerful few would then be gratified at the expense of society generally, as has always been the case in despotic governments. And such must always be the case where the biblical priests, uh, where the biblical principles, excuse me, of civil government are set aside, however liberal the form of government may be. The moment that these principles are departed from, that moment a nature, a nation enters upon dangerous ground, and no human wisdom or foresight can possibly balance the machinery of government so as to prevent encroachments on the rights of one part or other of the nation. Despotism on the one hand, or anarchy on the other, must be the result. The happiness of a nation requires that the citizens should be protected in all things allowed by the law of God, their persons, their political rights, and their property. If they are disturbed in one or other of these, their happiness is interfered with. Firstly, citizens have a right to be protected in their persons. It is the duty of a government to throw the shield of protection over even the humblest, as well as the most powerful citizen, as perfectly as possible, and if, in any case, he is injured, to redress his wrong. He is to be protected, especially in the enjoyment of personal freedom. If a government makes or suffers him to be made a slave, his happiness is not only interfered with, but entirely destroyed, as far as it is in the power of a man to make him unhappy. To deprive anyone of the right of personal freedom, unless as the punishment of crime, 
is a violation as well of the law of God as of the dictates of reason, and is of all privations the most aversive of the ends of civil government. A government is destitute of an essential characteristic of God's ordinance for good to man if the personal freedom of the subjects of government is not secured and protected. Quote, no power which deprives the subject of civil liberty is approved of or sanctioned by God or ought to be esteemed or supported by man as a moral institution. Unquote. Reformation Principles, pages 114 and 115 from the 1835 edition. Uh, see also page 119. It is of no importance, as far as this principle is concerned, whether the encroachment is made by the few against the many, or by the many against the few. As it, respect, as it respects moral principle, it makes no difference whether 12 million hold 3 million in the condition of slavery, or whether the 3 million hold the 12 million in this condition. In either case, there is a violation of human rights and a transgression of the divine law, and the ends of government are defeated. The principle is not changed, nor is the evil lessened by any consideration of, of constitutional or legal peculiarity in a nation. A people, when they organize themselves into a national condition, cannot rightfully confer a power upon the government which they create of reducing to a state of slavery or holding anyone in that state, anyone within its jurisdiction. The will of a majority of the people cannot make it right. There is a power superior to the will of the majority, namely the will of God. A majority have indeed the right to determine the constitution and laws by which they are to be governed, and this they exercise through the medium of their representatives. But this right is subordinate to the express will of the rulers of the of the excuse me, the express will of the ruler of the universe, who is superior to all nations, from whom, if they have power, they are derived it. But he has not given authority to to nations to deprive any of their citizens, few or many, of personal freedom. This is an inalienable right which human authority cannot rightfully touch. It is true that in lieu of the advantages gained by the social relation, men surrender part of their private rights, but there is not a surrender of them all. For were this the case, the social relation would be worse than useless. It would be a positive injury. The advantage to the individual is that by parting with certain original rights, the exercise of which they are not the exercise of which are not necessary to his happiness, those that are necessary are more perfectly secured to him. Such, for example, is the right of redressing wrongs which he may suffer. This he surrenders into the hands of society. His happiness is not impaired by this, but rather increased. For there is a greater probability that redress shall be obtained through the medium of the magistrate than by the exercise of the original right. Slavery is opposed to the re revealed will of God. Quote, he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hands, shall surely be put to death. The law was made for men stealers. Unquote. Exodus 21.16, 1 Timothy 1.10. The sin thus pointedly condemned in Scripture, a government is bound to prevent by all due care, and if committed, to punish with the utmost severity. The divine law secures to every man in the social state the right of personal freedom, and makes it the duty of civil rulers to see that every person within the state be protected in its enjoyment. A government must not oppress those over whom it exercises rule, nor suffer one part to oppress another. They are bound to rule in the fear of God. Quote, they shall judge the people with just judgment. They shall not respect persons. That which is altogether just shalt thou follow. Unquote. 2 Samuel 23.3, Deuteronomy 16 verses 18 through 20. The privation of personal freedom is the greatest injustice, and of all kinds of oppression, the most intolerable and the most ruinous to the oppressed. The right of personal freedom, a government is bound to protect in the case of even the stranger who has sought protection within its jurisdiction from the power of the oppressor. Quote, Thou shalt not deliver unto his master the servant which has escaped from his master unto thee, now he shall dwell with thee even among you in the place which he shall choose in one of thy gates where, where it liketh him best. Thou shalt not oppress him. Unquote. Deuteronomy 23, verses 15 and 16.